the turf wars, the struggle for victimhood supremacy between feminists and transgender ideologists. Turf wars have erupted over who is and who isn't a woman. And no, turf is not a misspelling of turf. Turf stands for trans exclusionary radical feminist. It's a term of abuse used by transgender activists and directed against feminists, even such iconic feminists as Germaine Greer, who think that men can't become women simply by declaring themselves to be women, or even by the generous application of hormones or reconstructive surgery. According to Greer, the insistence that man-made women be accepted as women is, she says, the institutional expression of the mistaken conviction that women are defective males. For saying this, Greer has been accused of transphobia. <laughs> no one, not even the greatest and the best, is allowed to make the outrageous claim that men are not women and women are not men. Or indeed, any remark that might seem to be ever so slightly skeptical of trans-related claims, unless they're prepared to attract heavy and often quite vicious criticism. J.K. Rowling, the author of the phenomenally successful Harry Potter series of books, was, it seems, just a little miffed by reading a headline that talked about creating a more equal post-COVID-19 world for people who menstruate. People who menstruate, she mused, I'm sure there used to be a word for these people. Wumban, wimpand, wumus. Rowling was immediately accused of, yes, you've guessed it, transphobia, and informed by some not so kindly souls speaking the old Honda, that trans men who haven't transitioned can menstruate as can non-binary people. I suppose Rowling should be grateful to have her astonishing biological ignorance so unkindly remedied, but in a comment made after her original tweet, it would seem that the wizarding author remains intransigent, pun intended, and is resisting the attack of her very own Dementor saying, quote, if sex isn't real, there's no same sex attraction. If sex isn't real, the lived reality of women globally is erased. It isn't hate to speak the truth. In the days that followed Rowling's fall from grace, a veritable avalanche of commentary, some supportive, much dismissive, descended upon her. Even in a source that would normally be considered sympathetic to conservative opinion, her views on transgenderism were described as strident, a word which, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, means loud, harsh, and shrill. A digital advertisement in Edinburgh's main railway station that proclaimed, I heart JK Rowling, has been removed by Network Rail on the grounds that it is likely to cause offence. In what would appear to be an idiosyncratic effort at literary intimidation, some authors who share the agency that handles Rowling's literary affairs, the Blair Partnership, left it in dudgeon, some of them accusing the company of, quote, declining to issue a public statement of support for transgender rights. Three of the authors who left issued a joint statement in which they declared sanctimoniously, quote, freedom of speech can only be upheld if the structural inequalities that hinder equal opportunities for underrepresented groups are challenged and changed, end of quote. A weighty pronouncement, no doubt if A, we only knew what it meant, B, if it were true, and C, if it had any relevance through Rowling's tweets. I suspect that what it means is that the authors believed that freedom of speech is conditional and should be available only to those who hold approved views, but I may be wrong in being so cynical. To their eternal credit, the Blair Partnership responded to this contemptible attempt at intimidation by declining to sign a statement of PC faith, saying, quote, it could not compromise on the fundamental freedom of allowing authors the right to express their thoughts and beliefs, unquote. And that, quote again, it was not willing to have staff re-educated to meet the demands of a small group of clients. From the famous to the not at all famous. In late 2017, the teenager Lily, formerly Liam Madigan, was elected as the women's officer for a Labour Party branch in Kent. His slash her election caused a bit of a kerfuffle. Anne Ruzillo, 
a lesbian feminist, a Labour Party women's officer in a different constituency who wasn't, to put it mildly, enthusiastic about this development and made her opinion known, was accused of transphobia by Madigan. And although Madigan's complaint was not upheld, Rosilo stood down from her position. The executive committee of Rosilo's branch resigned in protest at the treatment Rosilo received. Whether or not it makes sense to have a position such as a women's officer in a political party is moot, but if there is to be such a role, and if one thinks that its operational effectiveness requires one to have had the lived experiences of being a woman, it doesn't seem unreasonable to insist that it be filled by someone who actually is a woman. What we can see in this affair is that there is no one, not even those with the most impeccable woke credentials who cannot be trumped by someone who ticks a higher ranking identity box. As a woman, a feminist and a lesbian, Rosilo ticks three identity boxes. Madigan ticks just one transgender, but it outranks all of Rosilo's. Writing in Spiked, Ella Whelan probably speaks for quite a few women and not a few men when she says, quote, I don't care if I get called a transphobe. Lily Madigan is not a woman. At 19, he's barely even a man. Of course, Liam should be perfectly free to call himself Lily and wear whatever the hell he wants. Most polite people who come to know him will probably agree to refer to him by his new name and by female pronouns. But should society at large and political and social institutions have to do likewise and even grant people like Madigan access to what have traditionally been women's public roles? If feminists protest that trans women are men who are now telling feminists what they may not say or think, then they incur the dreaded censure of being called transphobic. Part of me can't help feeling a soupçon of schadenfreude, if you forgive me mixing my languages, a feeling I can't quite repress, as the wind sowed by radical feminists by their ad strategic adoption of the notion of gender to further their own ends, returns as the whirlwind of transgenderism to blow them away. But what is source for the goose is apparently not source for the gander, or maybe it's the other way around. It's so easy to get confused. In 2018, David Lewis put himself forward as a candidate for a position in his constituency Labour Party branch in Basingstoke in the United Kingdom. Nothing unusual or newsworthy in that you might think, except that Lewis is a man and the position he applied for is that of women's officer. And in order to be eligible for consideration, candidates have to self-identify as women. So far, so like Lily Madigan. So that's just what our David did, claiming tongue firmly in cheek, it would seem, that he self-identifies as a woman on Wednesdays between 6.50 a.m. and midnight. And why not, say all of us? Why should one's identity be limited by anything as flimsy as temporal considerations? The Labour Party has officially ruled that people who self-identify as women are allowed to be added to all women's shortlists and to stand as women's officers. These roles are open to men who now identify as women and no medical certification is required to attest to this transition. According to Labour Party policy, quote, all women shortlists are open to all women, including self-identifying trans women. Similarly, women's officers and minimum quotas for women in the Labour Party are open to all women, including self-identifying trans women, end of quote. Mr. Lewis said his application was intended to highlight problems with self-identification, specifically to demonstrate what happens, quote, when you say that someone's gender depends only on what they say and nothing else, end of quote. Despite their avowedly liberal and progressive transgender policy, the Labour Party, channeling Queen Victoria, it would seem, was not amused by Mr. Lewis's application and his membership of the party was suspended. Joan Robbins writes, feminists are beginning to recognize the threat of transgenderism, not only to fair competition in athletics, but to women as a whole. If a male is allowed to join the female sex simply by declaring he feels like a woman, is there really such a thing as women? Is there any basis for protecting women in private spaces, such as restrooms and locker rooms, colleges, dormitories, even prisons? Is there any way to ensure that programs designed to help women, such as dedicated loans or set-asides in government contracting, are restricted to actual women? 
Transgender radicals are so concerned about the resistance from feminists, especially lesbians, that they have created their own slur to describe the leftist dissidents, trans exclusionary radical feminists or TERFs. The name calling, however, has not deterred these feminists who realize that enshrining legal rights based on gender identity rather than sex would eliminate women and girls as a coherent legal category worthy of civil rights protection. End of quote from Robbins. The word war in turf wars is not entirely metaphorical. A confrontation between transgender activists and radical feminists took place at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park in October 2017, during which a woman who was filming what was termed a gender recognition talk had her camera taken from her, was knocked to the ground and then was punched and kicked. Maria McLachlan, age 61, a gender critical feminist, was struck by someone called Tara Wolf, age 26, while attending an outdoor meeting called to discuss changes to the Gender Recognition Act that would make it easier for people to self-define their gender. Feminists have been less than happy at the proposal to eviscerate the concept of woman, pointing out the dangers of allowing anyone to define their gender on a whim. If men can decide to be women simply by filling out a form, they would thereby be entitled to have access to women's changing rooms, women's sporting competitions, women's refuges and the like. Tara Wolf is not only considerably younger than the woman she assaulted, but is also, despite the name, not of the same sex. To rub salt into the wound, the judge in the case suggested that Ms. McLaughlin might refer to the defendant as she while giving evidence. Ms. McLaughlin replied to this suggestion, not unreasonably, quote, I'm used to thinking of this person who is a male as male, end of quote. Wolf was convicted and fined 150 pounds. I, I never thought I would feel sorry for radical feminists, but the spectacle of an elderly woman being beaten up by a man masquerading as a woman has managed to squeeze an ounce of sympathy from my hard heart. A particularly charming battle in the turf wars took place in 2018 at the San Francisco Library. The library sponsored a show entitled The Genderette's Antifa Art, and in so doing, according to the report, it, quote, allowed a group of misogynist males to take over public space in order to promote violence against women as an art form. To some radical trans activists, TERFs, a slur for females who crit critique gender ideology, deserve to be murdered for denying that someone with a man's body can really be a woman, end of quote. It appears that the library exhibit included shirts with the slogan, quote, your apathy is killing us, and, quote, I punch turfs, end of quote. Weapons were displayed throughout the exhibit, quote, including a large cardboard sculpture of a skeleton with phallus holding an axe, six brightly colored baseball bats, and a series of weapons labeled a fam sledgehammer and trans labris, or axe. The reporter concludes the piece by writing, the, the genderettes invert power relations by allowing men claiming to be women to craft an identity based on fictional oppression by feminists. In reality, their gender politics is merely misogyny in drag. It's a twist on the older paradigm of sexist males telling women to get in their place. Today, men on the left are instructing women that they are on the wrong side of history. Trans activists even go so far as accusing lesbians of discriminating and creating a cotton ceiling if they refuse to have sex with biological males who identify as women. Dame Jenny Murray is one of those awful turf people who it seems are intent on oppressing poor innocent trans people. What was her crime? Well, Dame Jenny, who at the time was the presenter of BBC Radio 4's Woman's Hour, wrote in the Times that a sex change can't make a man into a real woman. The BBC reprimanded her, telling her she should remain impartial on the subject since impartiality apparently requires one to deny reality. Rachel Cohen, the executive director of Stonewall, a transgender charity, questioned Murray's right to question other people's identities and said that Murray's comment had been reductive and hurtful. Cohen said, somewhat nomically, 
quote, whether you are trans or not, your identity is yours alone. I do not question your identity, Jenny. And in return, I wouldn't expect you to question mine or anyone else's. What right would you have to do so? End of quote. Well, I'm not quite sure what questioning someone's identity is, but, but let's press on. Cohen again said, quote, trans women have every right to have their identity and experiences respected too. They are women, just like you and me, and their sense of their gender is as ingrained in their identity as yours or mine, end of quote. Cohen's claim that trans women are women just like you and me, me being in this case Dame Jenny, is just a little bit question begging. If trans women were women just like Murray and Cohen, it wouldn't be an issue. It's precisely because they are not women, just like Cohen and Murray, that there is an issue to be resolved. Moreover, Cohen's notion of gender identity as something that is ingrained would seem to make gender not something ephemeral, not something socially constructed, but something essential to the person, something a bit like, well, like one's sex, actually. I believe that Dame Jenny got things right, but for the wrong reason. She appears to think that the reason a sex change can't make a man into a real woman is simply that men grow up with masculine privileges and so can't have the experiences of real women. That would make being a man or a woman a matter of contingent experience, which of course is nonsense. No, Dame Jenny, the reason men can't be women or women men has nothing to do with privilege, whatever that may be, and everything to do with biology. As one might expect, not all feminists are TERFs. In the dim and distant past of 2012, Buzz Caveney, writing in The Guardian, took her feminist sister to task for what she regarded as their anti-intellectualism, emphasis on innate knowledge, fetishization of tiny ideological differences, heresy hunting, conspiracy theories, rhetorical use of images of disgust, talk of stabs in the back, and romantic apocalypticism all of which she thinks, with some justice if true, amounts to something less than feminism and more of a cult. Well, I couldn't have put it better myself, Miss Caveney. Despite her scolding of her sisters, however, I suspect that Miss Caveney doesn't dissent much, if at all, from the manicia of radical feminist dogma. What gets up her nose is that her turf friends aren't all that keen on having transgenderists invading their turf. They would prefer feminists to be either women who have suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune in being born female and living through the trauma of repression by the patriarchy, or men who, for whatever reason, believe or pretend to believe the usual radical feminist nonsense about patriarchal oppression. What they most assuredly don't want is men disguised as women jumping on their victimhood bandwagon. David Green tells us, just in case we didn't already have suspected that, quote, victimhood as a political stasis is best understood as the outcome of a political strategy by some groups aimed at gaining preferential treatment. More recently, Libby Purvis was of the opinion that, quote, the sisterhood is crazy to bar its door to trans women, end of quote. Purvis objects to the rejection by such as Dame Murray of the claim that transgender women are real women. Purvis objects, in my view, correctly to the arguments that trans women, because they have had the privilege of being men, or because they haven't gone through the pain of puberty, PMT, or menopause, they can't be women. And she's absolutely right to reject the male privilege and non-persecution arguments as unfitting men to be women. But she concludes wrongly, employing a delightful but surely inadvertent understatement that, quote, the differences between genders are not extreme or even absolute, except in reproductive feasibility, end of quote. Most people would not think reproductive feasibility an insignificant difference between the sexes. The difference between genders is, well, who knows what. <laughs> On the other hand, the difference between the sexes is precisely extreme and absolute, except in the very limited case of intersex individuals. Zoe Williams is yet another non-TERF feminist. She believes that feminist solidarity empowers everyone and that the feminist movement must be trans inclusive. According to her, quote, feminism takes the side of the oppressed. That is a raison d'etre, end of quote. Well, let's see how this argument might run. Feminism is a movement in support of the oppressed. Trans people are oppressed. Therefore, feminists should support trans people. 
Well, if we are to take this argument at face value, we might wonder why feminism is called feminism and not rather say anti-oppressionism. Williams believe that the mainstream feminist view is in fact trans-inclusive. And she concludes her piece ringingly by saying, solidarity is boring to talk about, but fascinating and empowering to live. Solidarity is not exclusive or pedantic. It is compassionate and fights oppression where it finds it. That is its lifeblood. That is why trans women are women, or whom, I don't know how to pronounce, W-O-M-X-N. All very compassionate and sensitive and all very much beside the point. After all, it seems perfectly possible, as Dame Jenny thinks it is, to support the rights of trans people to be trans without having to accept the claim of some, not all, men who have transitioned, that they are in fact fully and completely and really women. The in-house argument between TERFs and non-TERFs lines up something like this. According to TERFs, to be a woman is necessarily to have experienced the oppression and prejudices that women experience. But if what prevents a trans woman from really being a woman is his lack of the requisite experience of oppression and prejudice, then by parity of reasoning, a biological female who had not in fact experienced such oppression and prejudice wouldn't be a woman either. This argument has the charming property of poisoning the wells. We can see a version of this argument in the writing of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Adichie, a Nigerian novelist and feminist, thinks that we cannot equate the experience of those who've lived as men with all the privilege that she believes is accorded to them, with the experience of a woman who has lived from the beginning in the world as a woman and who has not been accorded those privileges. So her argument appears to run. Women are victims of oppression. You've been a man and thus not a victim of oppression. So you can't now consider yourself a woman because you haven't been oppressed as women have been. On the other side of the argument, someone like the trans activist Rachel Willis concedes that while Adichie is correct in saying that women are oppressed, she ignores the fact that women are privileged in as much as they have been accepted in their female gender since they were born, unlike transgender women who have had to struggle against you've guessed it, oppression to get to where they are. Much the same point was made by Diana Thomas in his, her series, My Transgender Diary in the Telegraph, when he slash she writes, quote, while women are underprivileged when compared with men, they have a huge privilege compared to trans women. I'm not sure, he says, they understand or acknowledge that privilege, though the hurtful comments often presume it, end of quote. And now we witness a struggle to assert one's superior victimhood. Your privilege is superior to mine. My oppression trumps your oppression. As Willis remarks, quote, if you want to play the oppression Olympics, sorry, cis women, you're going to lose more often than not. That's why this conversation isn't productive. If that were the case, many of your rich white faves wouldn't be real women either. On the centrality and importance of the experience of oppression as constituting what it is that one really is, the trans activists and their non-TERF feminist allies and the TERFs are all agreed. But in making this claim central to their arguments, they're sublimely missing the point. Are they seriously suggesting that the essence of what they are consists in their being victims? The TERF's denial that trans women are women should be based on the fairly obvious fact that however they present themselves, whatever form of hormonal or surgical alterations they undergo, men cannot ever become women because it's simply not possible for that to happen. The turf argument doesn't appear to be based as it should be on the impossibility of changing one's sex, but rather on the fact of what they perceive as sexual oppression, which if it exists at all is surely a contingent rather than the necessary phenomenon. Leaving to one side the intellectual lack of hygiene in using contingent experience as a necessary condition of ontological status, on the point of strategy alone, if TERFs want to play the victimhood game on the pitch of oppression, then as Raquel Willis has indicated, they are inevitably going to lose out to the transgenderists whose home ground oppression is. Some academics have come under attack for their non-subscription to the new normative environment. One of these is Professor Selina Todd of Oxford, who specializes in the history of working class women and feminism in modern Britain. 
Professor Todd was no platformed by an event she herself had helped to organize and was accused of transphobia because of her involvement in women's rights advocacy and her teaching of feminist history. Other female academics who have come under attack are Renning's Professor Rosa Friedman and Sussex University's Professor Kathleen Stock. Whatever the sins of their academic superiors, it is reassuring and gratifying to know that the intellectual caliber of her students is as strong as it has ever been. In a series of tweets in 2018, the LGBTQ group at Goldsmith College London, wheeling their weapons of mass instruction and up to minute wokeness said, quote, the ideas of TERFs and anti-trans bigots literally kill and must be eradicated through re-education. Strong stuff. Rejecting the idea that men can become women and resisting the use by such transitioned or transitioning men of women's toilets and other female only spaces literally kills. Perhaps slightly hyperbolic, you might think. Maybe a tad hysterical, just a wee bit over the top. Not content to rest on their laurels, the LGBTQ group suggested that a certain Claire Graham should be sent to the Gulag. What was Ms. Graham's heinous offence? Counter-revolutionary terrorism? Stealing candy from little children? Woman-splaining? No, 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 no. She had written to object to the LGBTQ's th threat to target feminist academics who they claimed were prejudiced against transgender individuals. Once again, perhaps just a little over the top, even if meant hyperbolically, but no. Our doughty LGBTQ warriors were anxious to reassure those astonished by the suggestion that Soviet gulags were benign places whose involuntary residents received education and training and participated in sport and theatre, a kind of butlins in Siberia, as it were. So much fun were the residents of these gulags having that, by conservative Soviet estimates, over a million of them died, probably from an overenthusiastic weight loss program rather than from deliberate starvation. In a rare outbreak of sanity, the Goldsmith Students' Union suspended the LGBTQ group and withdrew its support for its activities. Commenting on this jaw-dropping piece of sheer stupidity in First Things, Carl or Truman wrote, quote, what raises the silliness to the level of malevolent absurdity is that the students, after their proposal was criticized, attempted to justify it by claiming the gulags were compassionate educational institutions. The incident reveals catastrophic cultural and historical ignorance. This should not surprise. The humanities have been subject to ruthless politicization and concomitant trivialization over the years. I doubt those recommending the Gulags have ever studied them. And I doubt that they have ever taken the time to read Solzhenitsyn's novella, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich or his magisterial Gulag Archipelago tri trilogy. Why would they bother when their teachers have told them that the history that portrays the Gulags as morally significant has been constructed by white conservative males, men with a vested interest in rewriting history to disguise their own imperial atrocities? Some women who attended a women's march in Washington in early 2020 were asked, what is a woman? Their answers were revealing, revealing the haste of a deep-rooted intellectual confusion. A woman is anything she wants to be defined as, said one. A woman is someone who chooses to express it themselves, said another. That's a trick question, said still another. Two other women who were selling uterus pins told the interviewer that they don't think having a uterus is what makes a person a woman. Other women with perhaps a clearer understanding of what a woman is hold the seemingly reactionary view that the self-declared gender laws that may eventually end up in force in the UK, as they have in other countries, will do nothing less than render the word woman meaningless with all that that implies for equality and freedom and, well, civilization as we know it. How could they possibly think that? Some seem to think that you can't become a woman because being a woman is a matter of biology. Others, as we've seen, argue that being a woman essentially involves a socialization and experience that only those born to it can have. For these women, if the law dictates that a man can attain to womanhood simply by signing a few forms, womanhood becomes empty and women, as women, lose any standing in society. 
all those who believe that men can't become women, whether for reasons of ontology or experience, agree that if being a woman becomes a matter of self-declaration, then all women shortlists in politics could be infiltrated by trans women, that is, by men who came to be women. The same is true, of course, of women's sports. If we accept the idea that people can define their own gender slash sex without external check or scrutiny, we are committed to accepting that the purely subjective and unverifiable supersedes the objectively biological nature of sex as a significant socio-legal category. All the fuss about gender representation, a favorite trope of feminists, requires that there can actually be a finite number of different and distinct genders, not an infinite number of them. If you can't clearly and definitively identify groups A and B, you cannot determine the relative proportions of A's and B's in the population. If you can slip back and forth between being a man or a woman simply by virtue of making a claim, then any possibility of equal representation becomes meaningless, even if it were otherwise desirable. If it becomes ever easier for men to become women, then mandatory quotas and all women shortlists and the like could, and this is a feminist nightmare, come to be colonized by former men. Dr. Nicola Williams of the organization Fair Play for Women is concerned that the ultra rapid expansion of laws and social practices relating to transgender women is endangering what she regards as hard won rights for women by compromising women only spaces and women only activities. If people want to live as though they were members of the opposite sex, she accepts their right to do so, but there is, she thinks, a fundamental conflict between the demands some trans lobby groups makes and the rights of another vulnerable group, women and girls. What this amounts to, she thinks, is that if someone who still has their full male anatomy wants the right to enter women's changing rooms or refuges or to compete against women or girls in sport, and women have no choice about that, that takes away women's most fundamental right, the right to say no to male-bodied people entering our spaces. End of quote. She believes that the effects of changes in the law that would allow for self-identification have not been properly thought through, and she calls for a rational discussion on these matters. As she explained, quote, data isn't transphobic. Evidence isn't hateful. Facts are just facts. And the plain fact is that the proposed policy of self-identified sex would have a huge impact on women and girls. But she notes that those who called for such a discussion are being categorized as, you've, <laughs> you've heard it before, as transphobic and their actions as hateful. And in some cases, their efforts are met with threats and even with physical violence. Self-identification would, she believes, quote, punch a huge hole in the hard-won system of women's legal rights that allow us to say no to male-bodied people being in our spaces. There would be no official way to tell who was male for purposes of single-sex overnight sleeping accommodation, for women's refuges, or for single-sex sports. End of quote. And so, the interesting to watch mud wrestle between the old guard feminists and the men in dresses carries on. But the trans chaps are not taking the resistance from the feminists lying down. Oh no. They know where their enemies live. And as someday it may happen that a victim must be found, they've got a little list. On that list is Labour Party stalwart Linda Bellas, self-described black, Jewish, lesbian, radical feminist and one-time leader of Lambeth Council. But now it seems bizarrely too right-wing for the shiny new Labour Party. Bellas, who as a black, Jewish, lesbian, radical feminist, which surely seemed to rank highly in the victimology charts on at least four counts, was disinvited from speaking at the University of Cambridge's Beard Society because she intended to ask some questions about the direction that gender politics is currently taking. The Beard Society, which had invited her, told her in their disinvitation, without any evidence of blushing, that while they believed in freedom of expression, quote, Peter House is as much a home as a college. The welfare of our students in this instance has to come first, quote unquote. It's not immediately clear how the welfare of Peter House's students were going to be adversely affected by Bellis's questions, though the nauseating cant of claiming to believe in freedom of expression while simultaneously disinviting a speaker is hard to take, even for a stomach as case hard in this mind. Of course, Bellis is just following in the footsteps of Jermaine Greer, who encountered protests when she tried to speak at Cardiff University in 2015. She too was accused of transphobia, 
And on that list too is Emma Salmon, who is one of those who argued for proper all women shortlist. She's had enough and she's not going to take it anymore. Quote, we've had serious perpetual aggression, she said. When we state our point of view, we're told that we are Nazis, no better than Hitler. The dispute between the TERFs and the transgender activists hinges on their take on the relationship between sex and gender. One feminist take on this topic is to hold that while sex may be biological and in some sense a given, gender is a matter of social construction. This is by and large the perspective of second wave feminism light. But there is an inner tension within feminism on this very point, however. For second wave feminism heavy, following Beauvoir and Millet, and the third wave feminists such as Judith Butler have in fact provided the theoretical basis for what would become transgender theory. One way to think of the struggle between radical feminist and transgender activists for supreme victimhood status is to see it as a kind of family quarrel, which, like many family quarrels, is characterized by a degree of nastiness not normally seen in afamilial human hostilities. Second wave feminism heavy is precisely the source of the division between sex and gender appropriated for their own purposes by transgender activists. Simone de Beauvoir was one of the earliest of the second wave feminists to separate sex from gender and to posit culture alone as determining the significance of sex and the female body. Kate Millett in her sexual politics took matters a stage further, advocating the end of male supremacy, the elimination of specific gender roles in child rearing, women's complete financial independence from men and the liberation of women from their children by the ingenious strategy of liberating children from their parents. Even more radically, Millet proposed an active embrace of what up to then had been sexually taboo, the complete removal of all sexual inhibitions. Millet made it possible for feminists to embrace queer theory, the view that how one expressed one's sexuality was in the end a matter of social construction, and so not fixed and determined, but fluid and changeable. The radical second and third wave feminists take on the subversion of sexual norms allowed queer theory to segue to transgenderism. Transgenderism, writes Scott Yenor, is consistent with the philosophical premises of second wave feminism, that is, divorcing one's body from one's identity. Butler herself writes that transgender theorists are carrying on the legacy of Simone de Beauvoir. If one is not born a woman, but rather becomes one, then becoming is the vehicle for gender itself. Some commentators, however, see a significant difference between the gender theories of second wave and third wave feminists. Joanna Williams remarks, quote, rather than sex preceding gender, Butler argues it is our social and cultural views on gender that construct sex. Today, following Butler, sex has been rejected by many radical thinkers as an outdated concept that has no more basis in material reality than gender. As a result, the performance of gender floats free from biology. Both are considered equally arbitrary. Gender can now be conceived as fluid and multiple. People are not assumed to be born male or female, but randomly assigned membership of a culturally prescribed sex category in an act of symbolic violence conducted at the moment of birth." Unquote. It's not without a certain sardonic humor that one notes that the transgender approach to gender differing in direction as it does from some conservative feminist approaches to gender nonetheless ultimately derives from the introduction and popularization of gender as a strategic weapon of deconstruction by radical feminists. Scott Yenner writes, quotes, efforts to separate transgender theories from radical feminism mistake their common roots. Transgenderism pushed against the door that second wave feminists opened. It extends the philosophical premises of second wave feminism and fosters its political project. Efforts to roll back one rolls back the other, while efforts to further one furthers the other." End of quote. Whatever the precise point that the radical theory of sex and gender is to be located in feminist theory, the transgender activists latching onto the dogma of the more radical feminists on gender and running it for all that it's worth, hold that gender is a given and that sex is something constructed and ultimately unreal. How gender comes to hold this position for transgender activists is a bit of a mystery and quite how gender can be what they take to be without a subscription to gender stereotypes is also a little opaque. The trans narrative asserts that gender is biological and inherent and not a product of social circumstances, family and culture. 
If a young boy dresses in a tutu, this implies that his body is actually female. Boys who like stereotypical girls' activities are now considered to be trans girls. Girls who like climbing trees and construction are to be considered trans boys. These trans activists, writes Julian Vigo, have created a narrative that attempts to remove the specificity of female biology by claiming it is a social construct while asserting that gender is biological. This last is a complete reversal of what doctors and social scientists know to be true. Yet any disagreement with this proposal results in one's being told that she is denying the existence of a transgender person. End of quote. Some forms of feminism took us from the not unreasonable position of attacking inflexible gender stereotypes so that women would have the freedom to make their own decisions to the ever so slightly less reasonable idea that there were no important differences between men and women at all. The claim that men and women are essentially identical is difficult to reconcile with the idea that changing one's sex or gender makes a real difference. After all, if men and women are essentially the same, What's the point of going through the trauma of hormonal or surgical interventions to change from one to the other? Most people would, I think, be prepared to accept that there are a range of sensible positions to take between, on the one hand, the extremes of rigid gender roles, and on the other hand, total androgyny. It comes down, as it so often does, to choice. If men and women have different needs and desires and inclinations, then under the rubric of the zero aggression principle, they should be legally free to satisfy these needs, desires, and inclinations. You may not approve of what others choose to do with their freedom, but then again, they may not approve of your choices either. Should anyone who is not a card-carrying member of the shiny new Labour Party care about the outcome of this family squabble between the transgender activists and the old guard radical feminists? Probably not. Still, there is a certain sanguinary, if guilty, pleasure to be had from sitting in the Colosseum, watching the professional beneficiaries of identity politics slaughtering each other in gladiatorial combat. But if I had to choose sides, and I don't, I would come down on the side of the women, the real women, that is. <laughs>